Sometimes people let us down. They promise one thing, they deliver another. We expect performance at this level, we get performance at that level. We're disappointed, hurt. Sometimes it undermines our ability to achieve what we set out to accomplish. What would happen in a relationship if a person consistently lets us down, promises one thing, doesn't deliver? What would happen in that relationship if we never deal with that? What would you predict for the relationship? What would happen in a work team if someone consistently underperforms and the supervisor never addresses it, never deals with it? What would you predict for that work team? What would you predict if the way a majority of supervisors and managers in a company deal with poor performance and bad behavior by ignoring it, avoiding it, going silent? What would you predict for that company? Well, as responsible individuals and as motivated leaders, we can't let situations like that occur without paying a huge price. It's a price in terms of results, but it's also a price we pay in terms of relationships. Problems unaddressed tend to get worse rather than better. Um, we uh, were getting a grand tour of a brand new headquarters. A uh, Fortune 500 company had built this massive, massive headquarters. It was beautiful with the glass and the brass. And the, the vice president who was taking us around was so proud of it and said, and it'll be almost paperless, everything's electronic. Well, we got to the end of the tour in this massive auditorium, and we said, boy, this is quite a facility. And just kind of making talk, I said, uh, well, how many people work here? And he looked around and said, oh, on a good day, about 40%. Daniel Yankelevich did a nationwide poll of workers in America. 44% report doing the bare minimum required to keep from being fired and no more. We're losing something around productivity. We're losing something in terms of per performance and accomplishing what we could accomplish if, in fact, we as leaders handled problems in a different way. I'd like to define a crucial confrontation as a face-to-face -face accountability conversation. A face-to-face -face accountability conversation around something that matters. So, if someone disappoints you, it's minor, no big deal, let it go. But if it's high stakes, then this is crucial. And if you don't have that accountability conversation, I predict, just as in relationships that aren't addressed, poor behavior on teams that aren't addressed, or a culture of poor performance, that results will suffer in relationships in a big way. How do most people handle these crucial confrontations? We found the vast majority go silent. They say nothing. They see a gap between what they expected, what they're getting, and they go silent. Now, there's a price we pay when we go silent in a crucial conversation. And I'd like to give you a metaphor, a way of thinking about it. Picture an afternoon. Hmm, I need a snack. Go to the refrigerator, open it up. Cottage cheese, that's a healthy alternative. Pop it open. Oh, Oh, it's gone rancid. Oh, it smells horrible. What are those little green specks? Gee, maybe if I sit it here on the counter in the sunlight for a few days, it'll get better. That's called cottage cheese on the counter. And let me tell you, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Cottage cheese on the counter. That's the metaphor I want you to keep in mind when you consider... What will happen if I don't confront this gap between what I expected and what I got? What will I get if I procrastinate this difficult performance conversation? What will happen if I let a problem go unaddressed? Well, I'll tell you, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Cottage cheese on the counter. We were doing a study in healthcare. And we found that there was a patient who was checked in at a hospital for a tonsillectomy. They put her under, 
and then amputated three quarters of her right foot. When she woke up, found out what had happened, she was hysterical. It was a horrific mistake. Administrators immediately launched an investigation. How could this possibly have happened? Well, one thing they found is they interviewed every single person who had anything to do with her care, ranging from the admittance clerk all the way through to the nurse in the recovery room. You know what they found? No fewer than seven people. Seven people who had something to do with her care recognized something's wrong here. Something's amiss. And not one of them said anything, including the medical technician who stocked the tray for the surgery. And he goes down the list and he goes, bone saw? Why do they need a bone saw for a tonsillectomy? Oh, well, not my call. Puts a bone saw on the tray. Seven people, if one of them had spoken up, may have prevented this tragedy. Well, as we began working at that hospital, collecting data, trying to understand the culture, you know what we found? They had created here a culture of silence. Now, if you walk down the halls, you'll see people talking and chattering, interacting. It doesn't look any different than any other hospital. But as soon as... As a gap appears, a significant gap between what's expected and what's delivered, they had learned to go silent. We interviewed groups of employees. A question we asked is, um, what does it take to get along a around here? What does it take to get ahead? What does it take to do well? Over 90% of respondents said, never question a doctor. That's what it takes to do well around here. Never question a doctor. In fact, almost everyone we interviewed could name someone who had been fired for challenging a doctor. Many of them had broadened that assumption from physicians to management. Said, never question your boss. Do what you're told. Don't rock the boat. The key to getting along around here is go silent when it becomes crucial. They had created a culture of silence. Could you have a culture of silence in a large organization, Fortune 500 company? Yes. Could you have a culture of silence in a division? Yes. A department? How about a work team? How about in a critical relationship? How about in a family? We found you can. And when you postpone having a crucial confrontation that's needed, when you procrastinate, when you decide not to have it, when you go silent, it's cottage cheese on the counter. It's going to get worse, not better. Now, I don't work directly with them, but a consultant friend of mine who does says a culture of silence killed seven astronauts. And when they didn't fix it, killed another seven. What do you think? Could that be a problem where you work? Well, most, in most situations, go silent when they encounter a crucial confrontation. Some go violent. Instead of going silent, ignoring it, avoiding it, withdrawing, they go violent. They attack the person, they're disrespectful, they bully, they threaten, they intimidate. And you know what we found? There's a price you pay when you handle a crucial confrontation by going violent. Here's the metaphor I want you to remember. Probably the single most important principle we ever learned about leadership is called law of the hog. Law of the hog, spelled H-O-G. The law, principle of the hog was discovered when we were doing research with a large wood products company in the Northwest. And they gave us access to their entire operation. Said we could interview people, we could observe people, we could wander wherever we, we went. And so we took advantage of this freedom. Uh, the day the law of the hog was discovered, um, two of my associates, uh, Kerry Patterson and David Maxfield, they go driving up this lumber road, come to this big uh, lumber mill, park their car, and went in to meet the supervisors that they'd be interviewing throughout the day. Well, they look around, and this room was full of big, big men. Great big men. Most with scowls on their faces. Arr! Some with tattoos on their faces. Arr! A scary bunch of big, big men. 
They looked around and said, if this is a representative sampling of the population in the Northwest, everyone up here is gigantic, they said. <laughs> well, he said, hi, we're the researchers. We'll be interviewing you throughout the day. Please be nice to us. Then everyone dispersed. Well, they sat down with the first supervisor. They said, uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. He goes, hurry it up, I'm busy. Oh, well, our first question, of all the guys on the learning team, excuse me, of all the guys on the work team, how are you selected to be supervisor? Rolls his eyes like, where do they get these dumb researchers? I'm the biggest guy on the team. You're the biggest guy on the team? How does that qualify you to be supervisor? I can make people do their job. Whoa, interesting criteria. Biggest guy on the team selected because he can make people do their job. Said, uh, well, would you like um, yell at people? How do you get them to do their job? He said, whatever's necessary. Well, um, what if someone's not responding to your urging? Whatever's necessary. Well, um, has a supervisor ever been known to hit an employee here? Yeah. Whoa, what happened to the supervisor? What do you mean? Well, how did they punish the supervisor that hits an employee? Well, they don't punish the supervisor. It's the employee's fault for not complying. Ooh, thank you very much. Researchers got together. Did you hear what happened? They slapped someone, and it's the employee's fault, not the supervisor's fault. Well, this flew in the face of some elaborate theories we've been developing about balance of power in organizations and how you get commitment to performance. We continued our interviews and started interviewing employees. Talked to one employee. Said, uh, how do you like your supervisor? Oh, he's better than the last one. What do you mean? Well, unlike the last one, he doesn't throw chunks of wood at us. We realized the employees didn't have very high expectations about what constitutes uh, good relationships with supervisors. Then the critical question. A researcher asked, well, what do you do when the supervisor crosses the line? When a supervisor goes too far? When a supervisor is disrespectful? Employee smiled. Uh, they wouldn't. How can you be so sure? We got the hog. Now I have to explain what the hog is. They go out in the forest, cut down the big trees, take off the branches, section the logs, mount them on big trucks, drive them into the lumber mill. Get to the lumber mill, section the logs again, mount them on big lathes, get these logs turning. Boom, boom, boom. Then they put these blades up against the log, take off layers of bark. Finer blades up against the log, take off sheets of veneer they glue together for plywood. Lot of good profit in good plywood. Then finer sheets of veneer till they get these long sheets of veneer sold to fine furniture companies. Lot of profit in good veneer. Then they section the log, they take out the smaller pieces, the two befores. Finally, they're left with their regular chunks of wood that can't be used to produce board feet. Well, these run down these big conveyors, and on either side of the conveyors, an employee, the big leather belt with chains to the wall so they can't lean too far. They pick up these pieces of wood and they throw them in the hog. Hog's big whirling machine, open mouth. Throw in a piece of wood, pssst, out comes sawdust. Sawdust sold the pulp mills for pennies on the ton. Not much profit in sawdust. Back to the interview. Well, what do you do if the supervisor goes too far? If the supervisor's disrespectful? Oh, they wouldn't be. How do you know? We got the hog. <gasps> you throw supervisors in the hog? No, where did they get these dumb researchers? We throw good wood in the hog. What? Yeah, supervisor treats us unfair. We throw good wood in the hog. Why? Duh, let me explain it, okay? The end of each shift, they measure board feet produced. They weigh sawdust. If board feet goes down, sawdust goes up, supervisor's in trouble. If he can't correct it within five working days, supervisor's fired. Bye-bye, fathead. All of a sudden, ding, the law of the hog was born. And literally, researchers saw between shifts, employees going down, rolling up veneer just like carpet, carrying it down to the hog and using it just like a pencil sharpener. Zzz, zzz, zzz. 
all that good wood into sawdust. Well, we found the lumber companies are not the only ones that have the law of the hog. We found in high-tech companies computer chips in the toilet. Someone walks by, scoops up a handful of $350 chips, down the toilet. We also found the most common form the law, of, the law of the hog takes is not blatant sabotage. It's excessive absenteeism and tardiness. It's decrease of discretionary effort. It's people not putting in a full day's work. It's doing the bare minimum required to keep from being fired and no more. It damages results and damages relationships. Undermines the things that we care most about as leaders and as members of the family. Here's my advice. When a significant gap occurs between what you expected and what you're getting, you've got to have a crucial confrontation. If a significant gap exists above the line, people are outperforming expectations, never let that gap pass without acknowledging it and thanking the person. If someone significantly outperforms expectations, never let that gap pass without acknowledging it and thanking the person. Bill, I heard on Friday you got your work done and you chipped in and helped Fred and Sally and the whole team finished up without any overtime. Fantastic. That helps the team, helps me, helps the company. Well done. Never let that gap pass. Similarly, never let a significant gap below the line occur. When you expect one thing, you're getting something that disappoints you. Never let that gap pass without confronting it. A crucial confrontation. Don't go silent. Don't confront it with violence. Be respectful. Be thoughtful. Be conscious. Work on solving problems and improving relationships. Do that, you'll get significant breakthroughs in performance at a team level, at a relationship level, at a leadership level. <laughs> 